Recorded live. All right. Is this working? <laughs> Do I have it? I'm sorry for all those that were trying to wait on me here. I, uh, I'm i very computer illiterate sometimes. So, <laughs> But anyways, let me just get down to it. My name is Jesse Vassell. Um, I didn't do a, uh announcement on my YouTube channel, which it all goes by the same name, Jesse Vassell, on my YouTube channel, um, which I should have. Shame on me. But uh, for future episodes and everything like that, I will be making an announcement. I do plan on doing this once a week on Saturdays. And uh, and basically what uh, my goal is, is, at least for the time being, is uh, my goal is the study of prophecy. Um, and right now what my goal is is to basically cover the basics. I'm talking about the very, very simple, simple basics. Basically for a lot of, uh, for those that... Uh, um, might be in a constricted mindset of they don't know what to believe because of everything that's going on in the world. Um, you know, so hopefully with this platform and understanding prophecy in a simple way that beforehand would have been confusing because they'll read the Bible and they listen to the pastor uh, teaching them what the prophecies say, and it's like, well, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. Well, hopefully I can be able to bring that up to speed to you, and hopefully that will be able to make, that would be able to make sense, all these uh, basic prophecies. So what we're going to discuss tonight, what we're, what we're going to talk about is Daniel chapter 2. It's very simple. It's a very basic, basic um, passage. Uh, um, it's it's not. Um, it's actually one that usually a lot of people unanimously agree on. You know, they, 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 they agree on this, but then they just totally throw, throw out the rest of the connections to other prophecies in Daniel and Revelations. But, you know, that's just, that's just how it is. Um, so that's why I titled this episode The Dream of a King. And, um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to be doing a study on Daniel chapter 2. What, I'm, what I plan on doing is I'm just going to read the whole chapter by itself, and I'm going to kind of go over some highlights, and then we're going to look at what the dream is, we're going to figure out the kingdoms that were in this dream, uh, all the way from the head of gold to the iron and clay, and that will give us a starting point of where we are in the time frame of history. You've been told probably that... Uh, you know, in prophecy, there is the coming of Christ, and then after Christ is, uh, is after Christ was cut off, uh, the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles, and um, that's when the Church Age began, and the Church Age goes on until a miraculous secret blowing of a trumpet, and then we're all caught up out of here, you know, in a rapture, and seven years prior to that, and then anti, and then a antichrist figure will arise, and and these types of things. I'm sure you've all heard that, and uh, I'm just going to come out here and say flat out, short answer is that is a very recent doctrine. It's really a doctrine that's only been around for about 150 years, um, and that's not what the early church believed. That's not what... Um, the reformers believed there's been a lot of deceptions that have crept in to the church and uh and this is basically what i want to uh kind of unmask so let's go ahead and get started uh we're going to read in daniel chapter 2 we're going to start all the way from verse 1 and we're going to read the whole chapter through Verse 49. I'm just going to read it straight through. I'm just going to read to you, and then we're going to uh, explain some things. All right, so Daniel chapter 2, verse 1. And in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled. 
and his sleep break from him. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king of Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants a dream, and we shall show the interpretations. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. That's a pretty bold threat to his uh, to his uh, <laughs> interpreters. But if you show the dream and the interpretation thereof, you shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. Then answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants a dream, and we will show the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that we would gain the time, because ye see the thing is gone from me. For if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for you have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. The Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matters. Therefore there is no king, lord, nor ruler that asks such things as at any magician or astrologer or a Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods, that's little g, plural, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause the king was angry and very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Now bear in mind, all the wise men of Babylon included Daniel, or uh, the, the, the uh, three, uh, Daniel and his friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, that this, they were included among the wise men. <laughs> okay. And, and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. This is a very important verse. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. I'm going to stop here real quick. I want to comment on, the, comment on this verse. This is not the same as a power that is that, that is to come. You know, if we, if we trace our steps back to the time of Babylon, a power that has become, that is to think, to change the times and laws of God. No, this is God himself saying he changes the times, he changes the seasons from spring, summer, fall, winter. He changes the times. You know, that's basically what this is talking about. And he removeth kings, okay, including, I mean, this is his will, including all the all the aspects of the interpretation of this dream. Nebuchadnezzar is king over Babylon because it is God's will that he was king over Babylon. President Obama is president because God allowed it to happen. Um, he brings down kings. Okay, so that, that's that's what I wanted to. Um, 
hone in on that verse right there. So moving on to verse 22. He revealeth the deep and secret things. He knoweth what is in the darkness, and the light dwelleth with him. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desire of thee. For thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. I mean, you get, I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is actually an aspect of love, the love that Daniel is showing even to these pagans that uh, he was serving, you know, these wise men and everything like that. And then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, <clears throat> art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation of? That's actually an interesting name, Belt Belteshazzar, if you actually separate it as Bel, as in uh, Bel, or it can be translated into Baal, you know, because obviously Babylon gave names to these individuals and they all represented pagan deities and stuff like that when they changed their names. Like Daniel's changed to Belshazzar and these types of things. And it's kind of interesting if you actually look at the meanings of names and everything. Daniel, Daniel actually means judgment. You know, this is a book of judgment. You know, you can kind of think of it that way, too. Um, so, then Daniel answered in the presence of the, of the king and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. Now, don't we have these wise men, astrologers, magicians, soothsayers in high places today? Yes, we do. Actually, they are in, in constant what in, in the biggest um, religion, religious institution on this planet. You might not think so because they have a veneer, they have they have a, a cloak of Christianity on them, but that's where a lot of the astrologers and these magicians and soothsayers come from. I would actually say that pretty much, not the, really the majority, but not. But all of them. Verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what shall come to pass hereafter, and he that revealeth secrets maketh known unto thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, this secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Verse 31. So here's here comes the vision that the king dreamed, and that God showed Daniel, and now this is the interpretation of it. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. And then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them, and the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. 
lowercase k, lowercase k, that's very important. That's why the King James Version of the Bible has that. And then actually it's pretty profound um, when, uh, we, uh, when we take a look at this and realize that this is a king of Babylon, okay, and this is the, you know, and as this chapter will further illustrate that he is his head of gold, so he is the start of all these kings and kingdoms that were to rule in succession following Babylon with Medo-Persia, Medo-Persia with the uh, Macedonia or Greek Empire, and then followed by Rome, the divisions of Rome, the two legs, on into the feet of iron and clay. And here is this king of Babylon that calls that 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 um, Daniel says is a king of kings, not the king of kings, but king of kings. And there's some very interesting quotes I want to um, share with you at the end of this reading of this chapter. Okay, not only are they blasphemous quotes that these people claim for themselves, but you can kind of put in perspective of the aspect that, number one, literal Babylon was not to be built up again, but there is another Babylon that is spoken of in the book of Revelations and in, I think, the second epistle of Peter. And when you apply this verse, thou, O king, art a king of kings, and then you apply the blasphemy that this mystery Babylon applies, how they apply king of kings, it actually is kind of an interesting parallel. And so Daniel 2.38, And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field, and the fowl of the heaven hath he given unto that hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Again, that's another interesting hidden little passage there, a parallel. Thou art this head of gold, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. This kingdom, this kingdom fell, but it was not succeeded. This kingdom remained. It was divided, but and then it was divided into this mixture of potter's clay. <clears throat> but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, so the only one that's going to succeed the kingdom of, of iron and clay is the king of kings, the true king of kings. And that's it. Now it's actually kind of interesting to see where we are in the in the frame of time here. And we're going to discover that here very, very soon. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of God, gods and a Lord of kings. So here Nebuchadnezzar was humbled and a revealer of secrets. 
See, now couldst reveal the secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king, and he sent Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon, but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So that concludes the reading of Daniel chapter 2. Now what's, what's interesting, especially the last couple of verses, is here is this, here's this Jewish captive this captive of Judah, and then here's this king who was humbled. Now, obviously, for those that have read Daniel, and they, you, you, you follow the, the chapter after, the king's heart was hardened, um, and he thought upon, it, upon himself to build this image that Daniel uh, showed the king the interpretation thereof, he decided to build an image of that interpretation, built all of gold. And uh, <laughs> basically, in an aspect to saying to God, I defy you. Okay? And he uh, said, so you know, My kingdom shall never be destroyed, it shall stand forever. And these types of things. Okay? And then obviously, you know the story. You know, at the sound of all this music, and if you don't think music plays a huge part in the you know, in the current events today, you're sadly mistaken. But um, at the sound of all this music, that all the prophets of Babylon were commanded to bow down before the statue and worship it. And there were only three. There were only three individuals that did not bow down. And that was... Actually, I think it was four. Daniel and... His three friends, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Okay. And what did they say? You know, you know, our God is able to deliver us, but even if he does not, we will not bow down. Now, what were these three wise men of God? What was Daniel three? What was Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego honoring? They were, honoring, they were honoring the God of gods, the King of kings, Lord of lords, and they were honoring his law, which is, um, which just talks about, uh, obviously, this is a graven image, and we're not supposed to be bowing down to graven images. We sure have a lot of that in these churches today, don't we? And they said, no, we will not bow down. You know, and, and so the king, King of the his heart was hardened, he built this statue, commanded all the province of Babylon to uh, bow down to this, except those four. They did not do it. And obviously, um, and then if you follow through to Daniel chapter 4, which this is a very unique testimony that anybody can come out of these systems because King Nebuchadnezzar is the only pagan king that has a whole chapter that has a whole section within the book of Daniel that he wrote his testimony of how he was humbled and how he was finally converted. It took a lot of humbling, but he was finally humbled. You can read about it in Daniel 4. It's actually an amazing testimony. Okay. So, but let's go ahead and let's talk about this image. So this image has um, very unique aspects of metal to it. And um, and obviously we see the most precious of metals um, ensconced in the head of gold, which obviously Daniel told us what this was. And, um, and he said to Nebuchadnezzar that Babylon, you are this head of gold. So what do we have? So in short, we have the head of gold. We have the chest and arms of silver. We have, we have the belly and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, the feet mixed of iron and clay, the stone breaking the statue, then becoming a mountain. Okay, so Daniel is not only, not only is he blessed by God, um, but this exact same dream the king had, okay, so as to prove to the king, there is a God that knows all secrets. Daniel is also 
blessed with the interpretation of this uh, dream. Okay, and um, and the rest of this is just historical fact. As we can see, each part of the statue the king saw in his dream represents an actual kingdom. All right. The first one, the head of gold, is in fact his kingdom of Babylon, which was in power from uh, roughly 605, 606 BC to uh, 539, 538, somewhere around there, BC. Okay. And in Jeremiah 51 7, it states, Babylon hath been a golden cup. This is just more clarification that Babylon was his head of gold. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken over wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Okay, and we also see the same wording in Revelation 17, 4 through 5. And it reads, quote, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having, what, a golden cup, in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Okay, eventually we're going to get into this whole mother of harlots and everything like that, but let's just stick to the context of this. That'll probably be in a future episode. It is very interesting to note here that elsewhere in the scriptures, the name of Babylon is associated with gold. This kingdom was one of the wonders of the ancient world. Today, it's actually referred to as one of the seven wonders of the world. I mean, it, it, I mean, you look at the history of the city. I mean, it was a beautiful city. It's a very beautiful city. Um, because of its uh, constructions, and uh, the the immense, I mean, the, the beautiful gardens it displayed, specifically the hanging gardens of Babylon. Babylon deserved to be represented by gold, the king of metals, because of its beauty and power. I mean, it makes sense, right? Now, in verse 39, we see another kingdom coming that's inferior to this head of gold, Babylon. And again, this is a matter of historical fact. Um, after a rough reign, reign of roughly 67 years, the Babylonian Empire was overthrown by the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. The Medo-Persian monarchy lasted 208 years. From 539, 538, 539 B.C. to 331 B.C. So, and also, if you notice what's going on here, is even though the metals are kind of becoming a little less uh, beautiful, okay, not as rich per se, but if you notice that the uh, the strength of these kingdoms are increasing as long as it's these kingdoms' longevity is increasing. Okay, so, you know, just like in Babylon, the first kingdom, we had only a reign of roughly 65 plus years. This one, we have a reign of roughly 200, you know, 205, 208 years. Okay, so, and also it is uh, important to point out that Daniel actually witnessed the overthrow of Babylon in his lifetime, okay, which was represented by the chest and the arms of silver. The uh, Medo-Persian kingdom was indeed, it wasn't, a rich and be- it wasn't as rich and beautiful as Bob- Babylon. However, its army was much more powerful as historic fact confirms. By the way, you know, um, again, the metals decrease in value, but the strength increases. So in verse 39, we see another metal appear, and this is a metal of brass, another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth. Historical records do confirm that in 331 B.C., 
The Greek armies destroyed the last Persian king during the famous Battle of Arbella. The Greeks saw victory by the powerful and young king Alexander the Great. The Greek Empire was then established. Its rule actually covered far more territories than the two previous kingdoms. So again, this kingdom is is stronger even than Medo-Persia and Babylon. So again, you know, these <laughs> each succession of kings is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. The reign of the Greek Empire of Alexander lasted 163 years, from 331 B.C. to 168. Okay. Um, but, uh, and, uh, obviously what happened with Alexander was, uh, you know, he died young, and, um, there were four generals that rose and took its place, and then the, the the Macedonian kingdom or Greek kingdom was divided into four sections. And what's interesting, when you come to Daniel 7, you'll realize that the third kingdom was likened to a leopard and it had four heads. Well, interesting parallels. We're probably going to go into that in the next episode, comparing this with the beasts in Daniel 7. Okay. So now we come to the fourth kingdom. And this fourth kingdom, Daniel 2.40, shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. So, and... Uh, so basically, after after the division of these four generals is when the Roman Empire basically came in and conquered them. E even though, um, you know, some people will kind of disagree with that. Um, some people will say, well, no, Rome came in and conquered right at the time of Alexander. I can't really... I can't really agree with that because, yeah, even though Alexander died young, he still had these four divisions of this Greek empire, and they were still ruling at that time. So you can't really say Rome came in and conquered Macedonia um, once the, the kingdom of Alexander ended, okay, because, uh, again, it was divided into four. I mean, we have to keep history in its context here. You know, we, the, there wasn't really any overlapping Okay, so it's basically a kingdom following a kingdom following a kingdom following a kingdom. Okay, except for the iron legs and then the mixture of iron and clay. But anyways, so after the the division of the four, it was uh, it was the Roman Empire's turn to enact its supreme rule upon the region. Prophetically speaking. Iron perfectly symbolizes this kingdom. Its military strength and discipline. Its domination over many conquered nations. Its laws imposed on all people far and wide. Every aspect of this nation was like the strength and endurance of iron. This kingdom reigned until... A.D. 476. This, the fall of this kingdom is the key importance in Bible prophecy. It sets up what we see in this world today. In Daniel 2.41 it says, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, Part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now, if you notice something, the dream that Daniel interpreted did not foretell a fifth global universal kingdom, as I stated before, to follow the fourth. But rather, this kingdom would be divided of the fourth kingdom. 
Yeah, you know, this would be the division of the fourth kingdom was prophesied, and it happened. I mean, look at the toes. You got ten toes, uh, and, and the feet of um, iron and clay. Now, a lot of people would like might get this confused, okay? Because a lot of people will kind of like kind of mix in with you know the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western, and they'll so kind of put them together. All right, and, and without realizing that it was only the Western Empire that was divided into ten kingdoms, okay. And this happened again, roughly around 476. So these Gothic kingdoms that came in, represented as as the ten toes of the iron and clay, and these Gothic kingdoms would. Um, be transferred into what we know as, you know, the English, the French, the German, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Italian, and the Swiss nation, which is the European continent. Okay, so so what does that mean? Is that this division of ten kingdoms would happen in what? The Eastern Empire or the Western Empire? Well, obviously, if it was Europe, it would be the Western Empire. See, in Daniel chapter 7, we see the aspect of this little horn. A lot of people would like to speculate just because of the of the um, massive slaughters going on by Islam in the Middle East. They, you know, which, I mean, I can see where, where they get confused, but if they're not rightly discerned, then they will be very deceived as well as confused. But you can see looking at the slaughter of all these believers and all these people in the Middle East that, yeah, you know, hey, I mean, come on. I mean, look at all the people, this, this guy. I mean, it's got to be the little horn, right? Mm-hmm. Key thing about Antichrist is the Antichrist attacks from within. Islam is an open antagonist of Jesus Christ. Antichrist is a Judas Antichrist is a son of perdition. And how did he betray Jesus? With a kiss. It's the same way that he betrays the body of Christ. With a kiss. Claim to be one of, well, let's just kind of bring that up a notch, the head of <laughs> the Christian church, so-called. So who were these Gothic kingdoms? Okay, well, well these, these Gothic kingdoms were the Saxons, which is, which uh, became the English nation, the Franks, which became the French, the Alemanni, which became the German nation, the Visigoths, which became the Spanish nation, the Suevi, which originated from the, which became the Portuguese nation. The Lombards is, is uh, originated from the Italian nation, and the Burgundians originated from the Swiss nation. The, Her- the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths were annihilated by a power that would arise within these um, kingdoms. Annihilated so much so that you can maybe pick up bits and pieces of history here and there. I have not been able to find any that kind of uh, go into a little bit of a detail of why they were just completely annihilated and wiped out, including all their records and these types of things, leaving very little, if not any, traces at all by this what would be called in Daniel 7, little horn, power. All right? Um, And obviously, according to Daniel 7, this is a perfect fulfillment of that. Personally, I don't know how they get a futuristic antichrist uprooting three kingdoms within a short period of time. I just... Boggles the mind. (laughs) <laughs> um, so Daniel 2.43 And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay 
They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So what does this mean? Okay. Well, see, this dream Daniel interpreted uh, foretold that um, in spite of the efforts of these European nations, okay, um, that uh, came out of the fall of the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire, um, that they would not really succeed in a unity format to form a fifth global empire, basically. Many have tried, but it would not come to be. You've had Charlemagne, for example, uh, Charles V, What's another one? Napoleon, uh, Louis the Fourteenth, um, Hitler, uh, William the Second. Yeah, I guess maybe you can throw Stalin in there too. Um, they they have tried, they have tried and tried and tried to place Europe under the authority of only one ruler. But, she, but each one saw this dream fail in a major way. Why? Because just like what the passage says, you know, iron does not mix well with clay, so therefore there is some confrontations going on from within, behind the scenes. There are disagreements and these types of things. In fact, that is why when you read in Revelation regarding the woman that rides the beast, that there are kings of the earth that turn upon the woman and devours their fl- her flesh and burns her with fire, because that is another example of this <laughs> divided kingdom not mixing well. Even though there is going to come a time where it's going to seem like it's 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 firm, you know. And what's very interesting is this, you know, this basically happened at one other time. Even though there was still kind of there were still arguments and, you know, disagreements within kingdoms that were under the control of what would become the papal Roman Empire. Um, but eventually, with the French Revolution, again, the king to the earth, kind of in a foreshadow, foretelling of what's going to happen, you know, in the very near future, uh, you know, how... The French Revolution basically it, it, it basically overcame, you know, the the political aspect of this papal Roman Empire, and that is the aspect of the deadly wound. Now, where am I going with this? I thought this deadly wound was supposed to occur with a, with this one individual that's supposed to come. He's supposed to take a bullet in the head, and this false prophet guy, uh, just like a thief in the night series, uh, is 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 supposed to uh, is supposed to perform some, uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat and wave his magic wand and poof, you know, he's resurrected and say, oh, yeah, all right. I, th- I thought that's how it's supposed to go. Mm, you no, know, if you really carefully study prophecy, you'll see that's not the case. Okay. In some ways, we can see that the Pope of Rome was able to get the majority of the European nations under one ruler, it is called the European Union today, okay? And but you know this is this is basically the closest it's been. However, these nations of the world have spread much farther than they were in days past. Now those ten toes depict a much larger geographical area. This is why the Club of Rome was formed in 1968 as prophecy declares. How interesting is it that in 1965 you had the Second Vatican Council. In 1967 you had the Six-Day War between Israel and, you know, the the Cockney of Jerusalem. And in 1968 you have the Club of Rome being formed. This is a very interesting little piece of uh, history there. And all these things just start coming together.
and uh, but and as this prophecy as prophecy does declare though they need to gather as one under one ruler so as to enforce the mark of the beast what's interesting in Daniel 11 is there's a very unique verse in Daniel 11 you know uh, which rich which actually defines this whole Hegelian dialectic principle and what's that well as short Hegelian dialectic is even though you have what seems to be two opposites fighting against each other they're actually working for the same cause and this is how this Hegelian dialectic system is and you can find it in Daniel 11 by the way I can't remember which verse it is but it talks about the king of the north and the king of the south that they shall speak lies at two tables or one table at one table so even though out in the open they seem like they're you know at war with each other right but behind the scenes they're actually plotting this whole delusion of you know these wars and rumors of wars and it is, it is these are wars and rumors of wars but one doesn't a lot of people don't realize that both both sides of this war <laughs> are actually communicating behind the scenes plotting planning very very sneaky way of doing things don't you think okay so now this club of Rome uh, you know was brought about again um, to bring it uh, to bring in a uh, model of sorts of how this global world system is to work okay so um, I'm going to read a portion from the Club of Rome webpage um, that states quote, quote the Club of Rome had its beginnings in April of 1968 when leaders from 10 different countries gathered in Rome okay and I just want to add that um, this organization does claim to have the solution for world peace and prosperity. What's interesting is, is Hillary Clinton just had her very first uh, campaign speech. <laughs> Check it out. It was on. It was on the Yahoo, and it was all about a new prosperity, a new, you know, a new kind of prosperity. How interesting is that? You have all of this global warming stuff coming right back up. I mean, it is hitting mainstream. You have the papal encyclical coming up that's going to talk about. Um, so-called climate change but what's what's really unique about that encyclical is I just found this out is that um, this has more tie-in if any of you have read the book ecclesiastical megalomania if you haven't you should go check it out but this has a huge tie-in with a encyclical that was written in the 1800s called Rerum Navarum which is a total Marxist encyclical okay um, well, Marxists by definition, we all know who control Karl Marx. Well, some of us know uh, who control. I'm not saying everybody does, but um, and that this encyclical is going to kind of pattern off of rerum navarum, which is what, which is the redistribution of goods, which is what, taking from one, giving to another, which is what, theft, stealing and also coveting because if someone has need someone can just walk right into your house or whatever and say oh, I need that and you just you can't really say anything because Papa Pope says that uh, they have the right to steal <laughs> they have the right to covet what you need just go right ahead and take it you know Sure sounds like changing times and laws to me, doesn't it? But I mean it's 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 very it's very interesting. Um 
because I was reading that off of a Catholic webpage about that, that this, this encyclical coming up is going to pattern off of this uh, Rerum Novarum encyclical that was written. So it's kind of interesting. You might want to go read a little in on that Rerum Novarum encyclical to kind of get more of a history behind that. And also, if you haven't got the book, check out Ecclesiastical Megalomania. He's got a huge section talking about that encyclical. And I do get, I do plan on making a video regarding this. Um, it's very, very unique and interesting. Um, but going further is um, this club of, uh, again, from the um, Club of Rome, quote, the club's findings and recommendations are published from time to time in special highly confidential reports, which are sent to the power elite to be implemented. On September 17, 1973, the club released one such report ent entitled um, Regionalized and Adaptive Model of the Global World System. The document reveals that the club has divided the world into how many? Regions, 10. 10 political economic regions, which it, it does literally refer to as <laughs> kingdoms. So maybe if they know it or not, they're actually fulfilling these very words in the book of Daniel. Now, as clay cannot mix with iron, these leaders will not cleave one to another. However, it may look as if it's working for the most part today, but when this finally goes global, we will know this is the sign for the end as we know it. All eyes in the universe are about to see, could be very close to see this event take place for, <laughs> it could resolve or it will result in the literal end of the world and all governing nations of mankind will cease to exist only the kingdom of heaven will rule from that day forth. So, um, and that's basically, so what this, what this does, what this dream does, is it sets the stage. It is a very simple, it's a very, very simple understanding of a quick stream through of history. Okay. However, it's one of the most important prophecies to grasp because if you don't understand how these kingdoms succeeded one another, and if you don't understand the aspect of the Fourth Empire and how it still is in existence today under a different rulership, you know, even though they claim have the same titles, I mean, they, they have the same titles and stuff like that as the Caesars do of the pagan Roman Empire. But if you don't understand this simple, basic prophecy, then all the other ones regarding beasts and horns and, and these are the, it, it, it won't make sense. This is why, and, and this is a very basic, just basic, basic layout. Also, it is a very important layout, okay? Um, I did, however, wanted to backtrack a couple verses, and um, before I uh, close this specific episode out. Now, obviously, I did say it's going to be two hours long. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be two hours long. It, you know, some of them could be two hours long, depends on what kind of discussion or fellowship. If I have guests that, that um, you know, we end up getting into. <laughs> um, you know, so hopefully there's no one sitting on the edge of a window like the individual in the Book of Acts does. You know, they don't end up falling asleep. You know, yawning and falling out the window. We don't want that. So don't be sitting on the window. Don't be sitting at the edge of a window on a high rise building or anything. We don't want that. That that would not be good. Um, <laughs> so I know sometimes. My voice can be a little, you know, but uh, it's all good, though. But uh, I want to take you back to Daniel 2, 37. 
which said, Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. There's something in the Bible called typology. Okay, and typology is biblical. What typology is, is um, there's a type of one thing, and the antitype is the uh, bigger explanation of the original type. Okay, and Scripture confirms this, where Paul says that regarding Israel, that he has that um, these things were written for our examples. Okay. Now, when you look at Daniel two thirty seven, thou O king art a king of kings. <clears throat> Obviously, again, I can't emphasize this enough. Little K, little K. All right. Just like how Isaiah prophesied about Cyrus, and and Cyrus was called the Anointed One. Cyrus came from the north. Who was the anointed one in the New Testament? Well, if you read Daniel 24, you'll see who the anointed one was, is Jesus Christ. Right? And when he comes back, the antitypical anointed one, king of the north, is Jesus Christ. Because the type, king of the north, of Cyrus, was the one that overflew Babylon and set the captives free. The antitype of that was Jesus Christ. He was crucified for, he died for the forgiveness of our sins, setting what? The captives free. Also, in his second coming, obviously we are in bondage to a worldly system. Even though we are not of, we are in the world, we're not supposed to be of the world. And yes, this system has enslaved us. But Jesus Christ is coming back as the true King of the North to what? Set the captives free. And he is the anointed one. That's typology. We have a type that explains one thing, and the antitype is the the more grand explanation. Okay? Now, there is also typology in the aspect of um apostasy and it's very interesting that Daniel said thou O king art a king of kings because there is a Babylon now that has a king and he claims to be king of kings not only in the aspect of little k little k lowercase k but he claims to be the king of kings, not a king of kings, but the, the king of kings and lord of lords. Now let's go ahead and just look at a couple of quotes before I close this out. All right. And then this will kind of give you a little clue as to what this little horn possibly could be. All right. <clears throat> this is from Prompta Bibliotheca in 1763, volume 6, Pop up to page 25 through 29. Obviously, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's just a portion of it. It says, quote, The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man. He is, as it were, God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief of kings, having plenitude of power. End quote. This next one just boggles the mind. This one is from La Civita Catholica, March 18th, 1871. Quote, The Pope is the supreme judge of the law of the land. He is the vice regent or vice gerent of Christ and is not only a priest forever, we'll pay attention to this, but also king of kings and lord of lords. And you know what? They won't refute this because they themselves, they themselves, 
basically say the same thing. These are just witnesses saying that what the Pope says, but they themselves say the same thing. So this isn't, you have this from a hearsay account, and you have these Popes in times past and, and, and present that have said basically the same thing. You've had Pope John Paul too that says, hey, don't go to the Father, don't go to Jesus for your for your prayers, for your forgiveness of sins, come to me. He just flags out. He just, he just flags out. Says you know, says it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, all right, sure. <laughs> um, I mean, over and over and over again. I mean, there's a lot of these that is documented. It's not no conspiracy. I mean, it, no, let's just say this: it's not a conspiracy theory. It's more of a fact. It is a conspiracy. There is conspiring going on because we have two kings, the anti-typical king of the north and king of the south, who speak lies at one table. So, <clears throat> basically, you know, and that's going to basically set the stage for next Saturday's broadcast. I want to try to keep it at 9.30. Um, so that would be... 6.30 Pacific. Um, so that way, you know, especially those, and hopefully there are more than just, you know, those that may be listening to this that um, actually adhere to a resting every seventh day. Um, you know, it, it'll be roughly evening time. And so obviously it'll be time to, you know, get the work week started again. You know, a lot of people don't work on Sundays. <clears throat> And I'm not going to go into that right now, but um, <laughs> but hopefully what I have done is I have established a good groundwork, um, and uh, and next Saturday I do plan on getting into Daniel 7, and what we're going to be doing in Daniel 7 is we're going to be kind of comparing Scripture with Scripture, okay, um, to see how these things tie in with the beast, and you're going to see the similarities between the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the uh, four beasts in Daniel 7. Okay? Um, and also, I do want to point out that read Daniel chapter 4, because that is proof that even a pagan king can be saved, can come out of her, my people. Even the king of Babylon himself, who was humble, can come out of her, my people. So if a king can do it, somebody that's sitting in a pew in a corrupted church can do it. All you got to do, get on your knees and talk to God. Ask him to show you. That's all you got to do. And sometimes it'll hurt. You know, why do you think Paul says, have I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. Truth can hurt. But I would rather be hurt by the truth than to be eternally damned because of a lie. And there is a lot of lies being spread. Futurist, futurism, dispensational, rapture theories is one of them. And it's going to lead a lot of people to eternity without God. And that's the reason why I want to cover these basics. Because everything that has been taught in cemeteries, I mean seminaries, um is totally contrary to the teachings of Scripture. And and it's interesting to note that, like, for example, you have Matthew Henry. Now, I'm not saying that these guys are above the Bible, okay? You, you, you have to look at the Scriptures according to the commentaries and see if they're so. You know, you have to be Bereans here, all right? But... Matthew Henry, Adam Clark, 
John Wesley, just to name a few, have written commentaries just basically explaining the same thing I did in the same format, and it proves the Bible. Do you know that even though these pastors, these pastors and preachers that go to these seminaries, you can go to any church, walk into any church, ask to speak with the pastor, ask if they have a commentary on Matthew Henry, ask if they have a commentary from John Wesley, and I guarantee you a lot of them will say, yeah. They even have it in their personal library. And if they would only just read those commentaries, they would realize what they're teaching is a lie. Because everything in those commentaries is the exact opposite of what is being taught today. And then you got modern commentaries that teach the lie. It was a very, very different time um, in the 19th century and prior. Things started creeping in, you know, in the 19th century. Well, maybe er earlier than that, but um, I got I got Henry Guinness on the mind of Romanism and Reformation. I know that book was published in 1887, so... Um, so that's why I got I got the 19th century just stuck in my mind right now. But um, but yeah, it, it, a lot of these things that have creeped in. Sure, there has been seeds planted, deceptional seeds planted in the 16th century by you know the Ribera's um, and the Bosses uh, regarding things that apply to a continuous consecutive block of time in history and throwing those things out and putting them in the future. It's called futurism. That's, even though that has started in the 16th century, it kind of grew a little bit during the French Revolution, you know, because of Napoleon who wanted to himself govern a nation of blues, Jews and rebuild the Temple of Solomon. That kind of gave birth to what is called Zionism today. And then uh, in the, in the uh, 19th century, it just blossomed even more. And then you've had, you know, the Margaret McDonald visions and John Nelson Darby's and Plymouth Brethren, who, if you actually look real close, if you actually dig deep into John Nelson Darby, what's very interesting about him is that you will find out that he was purposely sent here to mislead the Protestants in America. I cannot remember what book or what um, article that talks about that, but he was purposely, he was groomed to be sent over to America to mislead the Christians over here. And so that is why it is the majority of American so-called Protestants that believe in a rapture and the seven year tribulation period. A very good port a very good letter to read is look up the letter by uh, Corey Ten Boom. Okay? And what she endured, what she went through. That letter is is an awesome letter. It it could very well bring tears to your eyes. And to sit here and think that we are so much better that we can escape <laughs> these things coming upon this world when Paul alludes in his book that if we are in Christ, we shall and we will suffer persecution. And persecution is not being made fun of or poked fun of or being called a bigot or whatever. And that, that's, this, that's, that's child's play. That's just saying, oh, you're stupid. And you're supposed to be hurt by that and just like emotionally wrecked for all life, for all eternity because of a word? No. Persecution is martyrdom. Persecution is imprisonment. Persecution is torture. We will suffer persecution. You know, just like and also I think in John twelve it says, I pray that you that I pray that you will not take them out of this world, but keep them from evil. And Proverbs 
um, in the book of Proverbs, again, it talks about how um, the righteous will never be removed from this earth. Never. But the wicked shall be destroyed. Uh, and there's passages all over the Bible that, that just totally throws out this secret rapture theory, that totally throws out this futuristic doctrine. But people don't want to read it because it tickles their fancy, it tickles their ears. And I understand that. I, I, I honestly understand that I do. <laughs> um, because we have not known persecution. We have not seen persecution. Honestly, I could wish that we could get, go into a time machine and see what those people, what those believers in the times past in the Reformation era, the pre-Reformation era, the world, the world ends is up. I wish we could actually physically, literally see what they went through. But what we do have is we have the books and we have the testimonies to show us what they went through. And it is your job to take these sources to God in prayer and ask him to reveal things to you. And he will reveal the things to you in his word. So that is all I got for now. Okay, and uh, I want to thank you for joining me. I know I was late coming on. I was trying to figure out how this whole thing works. Um, and uh, tune in next week. It'll be on Saturday, 9.30 p.m. And uh, I might have somebody on here helping me with Daniel 7. I'm not, I can't confirm that yet, but... Um, you know, it will be interesting to go out two by two, <laughs> just as Jesus said. Um, it's always nice to have another witness for the truth speaking alongside you. Um, but uh, but again, you know, this is this is the basic covering that we did in Daniel two. Next week, it's going to be a little. It's going to be a little more deep, but. As we continue further on with these prophecies, it's going to get deeper and deeper. You know, so um, this episode will be put into the archive section. So if you missed it, it will be on YouTube. It will be on my channel, and you can also go to Truth Be Told eighty two um, on Talk Shoe, type it in the search word, and it will be right there in the archive section. So. I want to thank you for tuning in, and um, until next time, truth be told, truth be known, stay safe. God bless. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.